Hello, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my Go class. So I just talked about functions and now I want to talk about closures, where a closure is really about functions that live inside functions and refer to the enclosing functions data. And I'll show some examples to help understand what I mean, because closures are very interesting in sort of the side effects they can have. Okay, so the first thing I want to do though before I talk about closures is I want to bring out the idea of variable scope versus lifetime. Okay, so we kind of already know about variable scope, right? For example, if I have a function and I declare a variable inside the function, it's visible inside that function. It's visible inside code blocks that are also inside that function, right? And this is back to our notion of, you know, I have a scope and I have a scope within a scope and a scope within a scope. And if I declare a B out here in the outer scope, it's visible in the next scope. And if I declare a different B in the inner scope, then that's the B that's visible and so on, right? So again, we have nested scopes, right? And scope in that sense is static. It's a feature of the programming text, the code that you write. It's a compile time thing. It's about who can see the variable name and get access to the variable to read it or write it. Okay, so again, it's really about the text of the program. And it's something that the compiler looks at when you compile the code to say, well, is that variable in scope? Can you reference it? Fine. So then we get the question, though, about lifetime. Now, in some older languages, the only way you ever got lifetime greater than a function was, you know, you used like a new operator or something to deliberately allocate something in the heap and you pass pointers around. And if you actually think about the code that I've got in front of you in a traditional language like C, you'd look at it and say, well, you're declaring a local variable B and you're referring a pointer to it, and that's going to blow up. And the reason it's going to blow up gets back to this notion of stack frames, right? Because I have a stack frame for some function that's calling do it. And when I start calling do it, I create a new stack frame, and it has things like the return address and stack pointer, and then somewhere in here it has the actual storage for the variable b. Now, if I return a pointer to that, so somebody else has a way to point to that particular location, but I return from the function and that space sort of goes away. I mean, it doesn't physically go away, but the, ne the next thing I do is maybe I call some other function, you know, db, and the function db reuses all this stack space, but somebody has a pointer into the middle of it, and now we have corruption. This is memory corruption, okay? So if I were doing this in C, you would look at this code, or C++ or a number of languages, you would look at this code and say, oh, you can't do that, right? Now, why is this okay in Go? And the answer is that in Go, as soon as the compiler sees this, it says, hey, B is gonna have to live longer than this function, and what in Go, the term that's used is escape analysis. The Go compiler does what's called escape analysis to figure out that the value you put in B, we're going to return a pointer to it, and it's going to live beyond the scope of the function, right? Its lifetime is going to be as long as whoever has that pointer. And so, of course, it immediately allocates B on the heap, not on the stack. Now, there are a lot of modern languages where everything is in the heap, interpreted languages in particular. All the allocation just happens in the heap, and this is not a problem. But that's inefficient. Allocating stuff in the heap, one, it's inefficient in terms of you have to go through a pointer to get to it all the time, and two, it makes more work for the garbage collector. So Go's approach is to allocate as much as possible on the stack, but when it has to, to put it in the heap, when the lifetime will exceed the scope of whatever context that variable is in. Okay, so it's perfectly okay to do what I'm doing here is to create a local variable in the function do it and return a pointer to it. Because again, that local variable will end up on the heap. The pointer will remain valid. Okay, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, again, this is a trivial example. I'm trying to show a point. Is there a point, would this be a good thing to do right now in this program? No, why not just return the integer? But I want to demonstrate the concept, okay, that the lifetime of a variable can exceed the scope in which the variable was declared. Right, so what does this have to do with closures? Okay, 
A closure involves a function that uses variables from another function scope. And obviously it has to be an outer scope, right? I have some f1 and it's in a scope of some other function f2, and f1 refers to some variable that was local to f2, right? That's going to involve what's called a closure. Because f2, excuse me, f1, f1 closes over b from f2, okay? Now, here's a practical example on this slide. I've got a little function fib. And what fib does is it doesn't return a value. Well, it sort of. It returns a function. The return type of fib is a function that returns int. Okay? It's a function returning a function. And if you look at the inner function, so the inner function here is an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name. It's just a function literal with some code in it. Okay? It uses variables a and b. It didn't declare a and b, it just changes them. The variables a and b were declared in fib. All right? So when I return this inner function, it's going to continue to refer to a and b, even though the function fib is going to go away, right? The fib runs, returns, a and b in theory are gone. Okay? But they're not really, they're going to live on, and they have to live on, because this inner function that we're returning closes over a and b, and so it keeps a and b alive. And that's why it's called a closure. Now, some people think that the actual function here, this piece of text right here, is the closure. But I want to tell you no, it's a function. The closure is what's being returned. And what I've got here is a function on one side and a closure on the other. So let's suppose I had a variable assignment. f is declared and assigned the value of fib. Now here, I'm just using fib without any parentheses. I'm not calling fib. I'm just taking the name fib, which refers to the function, and assigning it to the variable f. So what is f? Well, f is essentially a function pointer. It's something that points at the code that is the function fib. If I call f, so now I put the, the actual uh, parentheses there to indicate a function call, I'm calling the function fib. f and fib are just two names for the same thing. Okay, That's the left-hand side of this. Now, on the other side of this, I'm going to do what we're actually going to see here in a second in a program. All right, I'm going to call fib and assign the result from fib to f. Okay? Well, f is no longer just a function. It's a closure. Okay? And what, what happens in a closure, there's really two pieces. There's the piece we had before. I need to know what the function is. If we go back one slide, the function is this anonymous function. Right? That's the part that was actually returned from fib. That's part of what's returned from fib is the anonymous function that will be called when I call f. But there's another piece, right? It's not enough to do that because we have to know about a and b. And so we have to have a second piece of this that holds on to the information about where to find a and b. Because that function, the anonymous inner function here, it, it changes a and b and it returns b. And it can't do that if it doesn't know where they are. Right? So that's what makes a closure different. A closure is actually a runtime thing. And you can think of it in the same way you think about a string descriptor or slice descriptor or map descriptor. It's this invisible thing in the background of your program. You don't really deal with it. But that's if you looked at what f is, f is the closure on the right-hand side of this. On the left-hand side, f is just a pointer to the function. On the right-hand side, it's a closure because it's got a pointer to the anonymous function and it's got a pointer to some environment, some way of refer referencing a and b, the a and b that that anonymous function will actually use. So now we're going to move into the playground and actually see how this works. So here I am in the playground, and what I've done is set up the code that I had in the slide with the fib function that returns a function, right? And don't worry about if you don't know a whole lot about Fibonacci numbers. That's not the point. But I'm going to call fib. Fib is going to return this anonymous function, but it's really returning a closure, and put that into f, and then we're going to call it. And when I run this, 
it's going to produce a sequence of numbers, right? 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on. It, it stopped when it got to 89, or it, it printed 89, it calculated the next one, the next one was bigger than 100, and stopped. And also, here's an example where we wrote a for loop and we did an increment, right? I have, I have started my initialization by calling f once, and then I just change x each time by calling f again, with the assumption that eventually x will get big enough to be bigger than 100, and my loop will stop, okay? So what is the actual f then? Well, f is a call to this. It's calling this function right here, which is doing this simple arithmetic on a and b and returning a value. Okay? But each time it's doing that, it's reusing up here, right, these variables a and b. So the variables a and b belong to the fib function. They are closed over by the anonymous function, which holds on to them. And as long as this f exists, Right? As long, this f that I created by calling the fib function, as long as that f exists, a and b exist. They continue to have their existence, so I can keep calling f again and again, and those a and b values keep changing. It's the same a and b variables, and they mutate on and on as I change them. Okay? If that didn't happen, then this whole thing wouldn't work, and I would just get like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 over and over again. All right, so that's the first piece of this. I want to look at this a slightly different way. Well, what I really want to do is I want to go ahead and create two of these. So I'm going to create f and g, and they're each being created by calls to fib. And I'm going to get rid of the loop for a second. And I'm just going to put some f calls. Okay. And then I'm going to put some g calls. And what's going to happen is we should get the same numbers twice over. So if I look at this, right, it prints 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. Those are the first Fibonacci numbers from f. And then it does the same thing with g. And the reason for that is that f and g get different a and b variables. Okay? Right? I call fib. When I call fib, I have local variables a and b right here. Okay? They're closed over by the anonymous function, and that goes into f. I call fib again, I get new a and b, because I, I've made a new call to fib, and those local variables are recreated, and they're closed over by this anonymous function a second time. So the closure, the function here is the same. Every time I return this function, the body of the function I'm returning is exactly the same. What's different, if you go back to the slide that had the picture, what's different is this thing, the closure that's being returned, it has the same function pointer, but the environment pointer is different. All right? And that's why f and g produce the same results over again. f got its copy of a and b from its call to fib, and g got its copy of a and b, different ones, in its call to fib, right? So somewhere out there in the heap, there are two, two a variables and two b variables that are distinct, right? f refers to one a and b, g refers to an a and b. And I could also change this by just doing f, g, f, g, f, g, f, g. You know, I could just interchange these and it wouldn't matter. It may look a little funny when I print it out, right? But I called f and g, I get two ones. I call f and g, I get two twos. I call f and g, I get two threes, and so on, right? It doesn't matter the order in which I call them. The f closure has one copy of a and b, and it mutates them over time, and they retain their values. And the same with g, they're distinct. So every time I call fib, I get a new Fibonacci number generator that has its own state, because it closed over unique copies of a and b. Okay, so that's the beauty of closures. They're very, very powerful because I can have a function that needs to take certain parameters, right? I'm going to create a closure usually because I want to pass it as a parameter to some other function. And maybe the signature that I have to pass is already determined. I need to pass a function that takes two ints. Well, but I want that function to have a value out of the context in which it's called, right? And I can close over a local variable in addition to the parameters that are going into the function. And by doing that, it's a very powerful technique. 
So I just gave you this picture in words, but I'm going to back it up with some actual code. I want to go back to an example we did in an earlier segment. And here's some code I was demonstrating probably in Replit. We have a sort.slice function. And what did sort.slice take? Well, it took the slice that we were sorting, and then it took a closure. This function here, the function needs to be a function with a particular signature. That signature has been determined by slice. This sort.slice function wants a particular closure signature. Okay, but if you look very carefully, I'm referring to SS in my closure. Now, SS is something that I passed to the sort.slice function as a parameter, but that was to sort.slice. I'm using it again directly in my function closure here because I'm closing over it. And what I mean by closing over it is literally the way this SS gets it is from here. Okay, the closure doesn't have a parameter that's a slice. It just gets i and j. Okay, well, how do I know what to do with i and j? Well, I'm using i and j in the context of the SS, which just happens to be the same slice I passed in. All right, I can do that because I know that I'm using this SS and that SS are the same variable. And so this is a safe thing to do. All right. I could close over some other slice and then this would be meaningless. I'd be sorting one slice based on the criteria of another. Well, okay, maybe not meaningless. Maybe there's some weird case in which that makes sense. Anyway, my point here is to say that in the context of this closure, again, the only thing I get passed into my closure is i and j, they're integers. But I'm referring to another value, a variable, ss, and that ss was closed over. It becomes a part of this function without actually having been passed in as a parameter. That's what gives a closure all its power. But now we're going to go back to the playground and see there's also a couple of issues that come out of this power that we ought to talk about. Okay, so this is interesting. I'm going to call a function, right? So I have my anonymous function here that I'm assigning to v. Okay, my anonymous function is do a printf. It's going to print i and it's going to print the address of i. But i is the loop control variable. It's the variable that I'm initializing and changing as I go through the loop each time. Okay, so the function that I'm assigning to v is a closure because it closes over i. And I'm going to go ahead and call it. Now I'm calling it immediately. As soon as I make this function, I'm going to call it inside this loop body. And let's see what it prints out. Well, yeah, okay, so little typo, lots of error messages, fix one, they all go away, right? What's interesting here is the printout, I have the values 0, 1, 2, 3, those are the values of i, okay? That's not surprising. What might be surprising is they all live at the same address, okay? In each case, the address of i is the same. So this is a little thing about go and loops. Now, it's obvious, or it should be kind of obvious here, that my for loop, right, I have for and I have a, a short declaration. So I'm declaring i, it's local to this loop, right? So I guess maybe it's not too surprising that that i is in the same place all the time, right? I mean, I could have done this differently. I could have just said var i int, and I could have changed that to an assignment, okay? And is this still a perfectly good for loop? Sure. I declared my i outside the for loop. It's no longer local to the for loop. And when I run this program, the results are exactly the same, okay? So in terms of where i is, you know, i had a different scope if I made it local to the loop, but it's still, it's a variable. It's somewhere in memory, and it doesn't move. So each time I get a different value, but I get the same address. And you're going to wonder, okay, why did I go through all that? Because now I want to show a slightly different program. And this time, I'm going to make a slice that will hold four functions. All right? Remember I said you can do anything with a slice. So if I can have a, a slice of int, I can have a slice of func. And I'm going to do that. And now I'm going to write a loop. And I'm going to be careful about my semicolons. All 
And the first loop is going to make something and the second loop is going to call it. So I'm just going to, we'll just copy this. We're going to do this loop twice. All right. And in each case, the i is actually a different local variable. We don't care this time. That's not going to matter. So in each case, I'm going to assign to one spot in here. Okay? So each time through the loop, I'm going to create a function and assign that function into SI. But it's really going to be a closure. All right? And in here, I'm going to do a fump.printf again. Percent %d at percent %p slash n i and i. Okay? And all I'm going to do down in this one is I'm going to call them one after the other. All right? So what's different about it, in the last program I created a closure and I called the closure in the same loop iteration. It was in the loop body, creating it, calling it. Now I've got a loop that creates and stores off a bunch of closures. And then I have a second loop that calls those closures later on. And that's going to cause a problem. Well, again, um, little typos, lots of errors. There we go. This should be a little surprising unless you're really, really quick on your feet. Because now when I print this, I get the same value for i. I get the same location, but I get the same value. What gives? Okay? This is a problem. It's not a bug in the language, it's a bug in my code. Because when I close over i, every closure takes a reference. So I'm referring to i, and this i doesn't move. So my closure down here doesn't have a copy of a value that was in i. It has a reference to i. And the i, by the time I go and do the second loop, right, what was i? Well, i was 0, i was 1, i was 2, i was 3. i became 4, okay? And then at the top of this loop, as soon as i becomes 4, I don't do the loop again because I fail my test. So if I were to do a, an extra little thing here, right? What is i? Actually, I can't do that because i is a local variable, okay? But if I could do that, if I could do that print line right there for the value of i, it would be 4, okay? So when I get to the second loop down here, every time I call the closure, it's going back to the same i, and i has that final value 4, and so every time I'm printing it, I'm printing that final value 4. If I go back to this slide and look at this picture again for my closure, I made a very strong point here of, in this little thing over here, the environment, I didn't just write A and B. I put little ampersands in front of them in red because I wanted to make it clear that what's being held in that environment as part of the closure are references to A and B, pointers, essentially, to A and B. Okay? We're keeping pointers. And that means if there's time between when the closure is created and when it's called, the variable I'm pointing to could change, and it did. I created the first closure when i was 0, and then one when i was 1, and so on. I kept doing that. But by the time I went to call those closures, i was 4. And all the closures used the same i, and they got the same value 4. Okay? This is a bug in my program, but it's a bug because I really didn't understand the nature of a closure. Now, just to jump ahead a little bit, you're going to see this sort of problem come up with Go routines. I haven't even talked about them yet. You're going to see articles on Medium where they say, well, there's a problem with Go and Go routines. And I'm going to tell you right now, it has nothing to do with Go routines. There's no Go routine in the example that's in front of you. And it's not specific to the Go programming language. It happens in other languages that have closures. I have been bit by this bug writing iOS software in Swift because it's very common in iOS to create a, a Swift closure, pass it to some function where the closure gets executed asynchronously, really later on. I do a network operation and I give it a closure as a callback. Sometime later, the network operation finishes and my closure gets called as a callback, but it referred to some variable which has the opportunity to change in the meantime. There's a simple way to fix this, okay? There's a very simple way to fix this. I'm gonna show you the easiest way to do it, 
which is going to look a little funny. If I could type. Okay, um, somehow I got the caps lock on. Let's get it off. All right, I'm going to do that, and if I run it now, it produces the results I expect. Not only does it produce 0, 1, 2, 3, but it produces four distinct addresses. Okay, how did that happen? Well, this right here, and it looks funny because essentially I'm saying I'm declaring I to be I. Okay, I can do that, it's cute, it's not that readable. I probably wouldn't do this. What I would probably do in real life is I would create a new variable name and then I would close over it and I would put a little comment right here that says closure capture. Okay, and that little comment is to tell people that I'm creating this new variable i2 to initialize it to the variable i in the loop because it's now a distinct variable. This i2 is a new variable every time through the loop. Its location is different than i, and its location is different each time I go through the loop. They're distinct. And so now each closure has its own value of i because it has its own reference to a copy of i that was placed in its own version of i2. Okay, Every closure has a different address for i2. It's right here. You can see it. And it has a different value. It has the value that was captured in that loop iteration. This is how you solve the problem. Okay, so that's really the basics of closures, right? A closure is a type of function call that has additional data from outside the function, like from another function scope. And it's closed over by reference. So it's sort of like a parameter, but it's not. And it can, it's very, very powerful. It allows me to get extra data into a function that can't come through the parameter list. Because very often I need to create a closure where the parameters are fixed by some other type. And so I can't just add another parameter, but I can close over a variable that's in scope and it becomes part of that function, and that, that's what makes it a closure. And it's, it's both very powerful, and it has a gotcha. And the gotcha is, because we're closing over by reference, if the closure is executed asynchronously, and that usually means later on, then it's possible that the variable that I closed over mutates. And so I've shown you a simple example of how that problem happens, and I've shown you the basic fix, and that is you create a local copy and then you close over the local copy, which cannot mutate again. Okay, so closures are very powerful. They have a gotcha, but they're a very important part of Go. We're going to use them a lot.